Welcome to episode 158 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Brooklyn educator Cornelius Minor about his new book called We Got This. We're discussing how teachers can be agents of change. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or to share your thoughts in the comments. A big thanks to Advancement Courses for sponsoring today's show. You could earn graduate credits or CEUs through over 200 online PD courses in 19 different subject areas. Everything is totally online and self-paced. And right now you can save 20% off each course with the code TRUTH20. That's just $120 per graduate credit hour. To learn more, visit advancementcourses.com slash truth. So today I'm super excited to be sharing this interview with Cornelius Minor. He is a staff developer with the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project. He's just released a new book called We Got This, Equity, Access, and the Quest to Be Who Our Students Need Us to Be. In this interview, he and I are going to be discussing some of the key themes that I pulled out of his book, particularly his thoughts on rewriting the teacher hero narrative and disrupting the status quo in our classrooms and schools. Listen in now as I talk with Cornelius. So tell me about the heart of your message, the thing that you're most passionate about sharing with teachers. Well, Angela, like, first of all, it's so exciting to be here with you. Um, and I think whenever I think about the heart of my message, it, it's actually really hard to encapsulate in one thing. There are so many hearts, but they all stem from this and that I am quite uncomfortable with the reality that we live in America um, and we live in a specific kind of America that's okay for one kind of an education for some kids and then a totally subpar education for other kinds of kids. And so just that, you know, our country and specifically our education system has been defined by intergenerational inequity really bothers me. And so, um, much of my message is around how we disrupt that. So how we can begin to look at the things that have plagued us for generations and begin to take those things apart. So many times as teachers, it's really easy to fall into platitudes like, oh, everyone should have the same thing and people deserve opportunity, but then we really don't act on those platitudes. And so, so much of my message is around like inspiring and moving people to action so that we can disrupt the things that aren't good for all children. Can you give me an example of something that you're thinking about in terms of those inequities? Oh, for sure. You know, and again, we exist in a system of schools and schooling that has been really defined by many of them. You know, when we look at data, we have become all too comfortable with the reality that girls don't score as well as boys in sciences and mathematics. And we've become all too comfortable with the reality that kids with disabilities um, don't always get to access curriculum that they need in order to thrive. We've become all too comfortable with the reality that black boys don't read. Um, and these things are not natural. You know, that girls aren't born bad at science, that black kids aren't born, you know, destined for poor reading scores, that these are the, the results of, of decades upon decades of policy that have really served to marginalize specific groups of kids. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is looking at how those systems work. So really looking at reading scores and asking the question, how did we get here? What are the practices? practices that delivered us here or looking at performance in science or looking at access to curriculum and really asking, okay, if, if I've got huge populations of kids that can't quite access a curriculum, what am I doing about that thing? And so it has been really rewarding and fulfilling to lead teachers and schools and districts into that work where we really take a hard, honest look at ourselves and we step fully into our potential as change agents. You know, one part of your book that really resonated with me was about rewriting the teacher hero narrative. Can you talk a little bit about why that narrative developed to begin with and how we can change it? Well, you know, I think a lot about um, oppression and how it works. And, and, and when I think about the role of teacher, just by definition, teacher is anti-oppressive. That, that when we look at, especially, you know, and I teach in public schools, but when we, when we really think about the role of a public school teacher, you know, that comes from, from several places and, and people, you know, many, many smart people before me have theorized public schools. So we've looked at Dewey and we've really thought about 
you know, the role of public school in a social development of a community. And, and one of the things that I often go back to, as problematic as he is, and we all know that Thomas Jefferson is wild problematic, but as problematic as Thomas Jefferson is, you know, one of the things <laughs> that, that Jefferson theorized when he was drafting the document that would eventually become our Declaration of Independence, you know, he was really imagining what America could be, you know, and again, at this time, America was but an idea. Um, and when he was really beginning to form that idea, one of the things that really resonated with him is the reality that, you know, and we know that that in in Great Britain, if if you were poor, you weren't fully included. If you were a woman, you weren't fully included. If you, you know, owed money, you weren't fully included. If you weren't a landowner, you weren't fully included. Certainly if you were black, you weren't included. You know, and and Jefferson began to ask the question, who could we be if we were more inclusive? Um, and I think that that's a really powerful question. Um, and and he began to theorize that that if we want to move away from a monarchy, and to have a democracy, one of the things that a democracy needs is strong public schools. That if people are to vote on the issues of the day, those people need to be educated. And I think that that's a pretty radical idea because basically Thomas Jefferson was positing that a strong public education is our greatest defense against tyranny. And, and for me, that's huge. And because, and that means that the work that we do as educators is hugely disruptive. It keeps us free. You know, um, and, and, and if you've got a group of people who are dedicated to preserving the freedom of a republic, um, you know, in some regimes, and especially when we think about now that the market drives everything, you know, that everything is driven by how much money that people can make. Um, and so if you've got a group of people who are just like dedicated to delivering on access and freedom, which is our work as teachers, um, then it, it benefits some populations of folks to undermine that work. And, and one of the ways that you undermine the work of a freedom fighter, one of the ways that you undermine the work of a teacher um, is you silence those people. And we all know like what silencing looks like, you know, that we, we don't respect people's voices. We don't allow people access um, to the discourses or to the communities where they can spread a message. And, and one way to silence people is actually to deify them. You know, because if you deify a group of people and we and we saw it with women's suffrage, you know, that when women first wanted to go and get the vote out, one of the things that people said was like, well, you know, they need to be at home because they're dainty and we need to protect them. So they don't need to be in the streets voting and they don't need to be in the streets advocating for themselves because they're fragile and frail. And so that kind of deification um, led to kind of this like idea that people could be marginalized. And I think the same is happening with teachers. When you say that I am a teacher, therefore I am a hero, what you do is you erase all the parts of me that are not quite heroic yet. And so you erase the parts of me that are still becoming, the parts of me that are still grappling with curriculum or with working in communities. Um, and so what happens is we try to live up to this ideal and then we hide all of the parts of us that are not heroic. So you walk into a teacher's lounge in America and what happens is you know, everybody is struggling through something, but because we're all heroes, we're not allowed to talk about that out loud. And I really wanted to use We Got This as an opportunity for us to talk quite candidly about the things that scare us, about the things that inspire us, about the things that move us, but also about the things that, that we're not quite complete on yet. Because I think in that um, becoming is where the revolution is. You know, when we think about who we want to be, you know, we don't come out as like fully formed, perfect teachers. But if you listen to the discourse on teaching, one would think that we are. And so I just really wanted to get to a place where we could talk candidly about who we are and about who we're becoming. So when we're not afraid to talk about our imperfections, then we're sort of removing this deification of teachers. We're removing this thing where... Um, where we have to be perfect and we have to be there to be the heroes to exactly. save kids. Exactly. And it's, and it's a lot of the work that has been done in, in so many communities where we're looking at the images that the media hands us and we're really resisting those and complicating those. And so if you look at like what we've been handed as teachers, you know, we've been handed this, like you all are perfect. 
Um, and, and I get that, you know, I work with some of the best colleagues on the planet. So, you know, there are days when I look at my colleagues and I'm like, wow, they're amazing. But, you know, but we all have work to do. And I think that when we really embrace that idea that we can do this work and we can do this work in public, that I don't have to hide in my classroom and close the door in order to improve. I don't have to like cry silently in the teacher's lounge, you know, when something goes bad because I can't talk about it that, um, you know, and there are far too many schools where we do that, you know, where, where if I'm having a hard day, I can't can't quite speak up on it because I'm not supposed to have a hard day because I'm a hero. Um, or if I don't know what to do next, I can't talk about it because I'm not supposed to not know because I'm a hero. And so I just think really complicating that hero narrative is really important for the work and for the world that I want to see. You also mentioned in the book that teaching is an economic and political mm-hmm. construct. And I think that's an important point to understand because Um, I hear a lot of teachers who want to separate their work from politics. You know, they see politics as something controversial and divisive. And we're, you know, we're supposed to all be there for the kids, right? (laughs) So we don't want to be divisive. So they'll say things like, you know, you know, oh, don't let's just stick to talk about teaching. Let's not get political. Can you help us understand why teaching is inherently political and why we can't really talk about our profession without understanding the politics that are affecting us? Well, absolutely. And I think the term being there for the kids in many ways is divisive, you know, and and it is my work as a teacher to walk right into that division and stand for children. You know, I always say that um, it is my role as a teacher to initially create opportunities for children and to eventually teach them how to create opportunities for themselves. That, that That's all of our jobs, you know, that we look at kids. I look at my 32, you look at your 28, and every morning when we go in, it's our job to say, what opportunities can I create for these kids? And how can I eventually teach them to create opportunities for themselves with respect to each other and with respect to our environment? Um, and so that being said, anything that stands in the way of opportunity for children is our enemy. And, and, you know, and there are several things in society that attempt to abridge opportunity for kids. And so, yeah, those things are political, but they are real and there are prerogatives. So if family separation threatens opportunity for my kids, then I got to be against that. If right. access to health care threatens opportunities for my kids, then I got to be against that. You know, so if kids can't have access to health care and it's abridging opportunities, then I've got to figure out how do I stand on the side of history, the side of law, the side of, you know, politics in order to make sure that my kids have the things that they need in order to be successful, in order to access opportunities. And so again, um, you know, and for me, it's been really powerful to see, you know, one big thing in Brooklyn here um, is food, you know, that, that we encounter kids who don't always have access to food. And that's a political issue. There were certain council folks who were for um, free lunches for kids, and there were certain folks who were against free lunches for kids. And that was political. Um, But one of the things that I know is that when kids like eat, they can conjugate verbs better. You know, when kids (laughs) eat, they can compute numbers better. When kids eat, they can create better art. And so people say, well, Cornelius, you were advocating for free lunch for kids and that's political. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, it impacts kids' abilities to conjugate verbs. It impacts their ability to do math. And so, yeah, so I always say when people ask me what my politics are, I am radically pro-kid. And that definitely means that I am walking into every arena that attempts to abridge opportunity for kids, and I'm attempting to disrupt those things. Right. And and you ha- and when we say pro-kid, that doesn't mean my kids. That doesn't mean yeah. kids who live in my community, <laughs> exactly. kids in my socioeconomic bracket, kids of my race. That means I got to be pro-all kids, you know? Exactly. And I think as much as we talk about being there for kids, I think there is whether consciously or subconsciously for a lot of teachers, there's an idea that, you know, it's those kids, you know, I go into this community and I teach those kids and then I go home. And when I vote and when I advocate, I'm thinking about my kids. I'm thinking about kids in my neighborhood. I'm thinking about the kids that my kids play with. And we're not necessarily thinking about all kids. What are the, what are the policies and what are the things that we need to do to stand up on behalf of all of them and choosing to not see politics, how politics impacts education. I mean, salaries are funded by taxpayers. Exactly. And <laughs> the budget for schools is determined by politics. Exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. all political here. And if we pretend that we don't see politics, it's kind of like saying, I don't see color. Well, yeah. you're missing a whole 
you're a, a whole realm here of information that can be useful for you in, in better serving kids. Absolutely. And when you choose to not engage in these things, you're complicit in them. You know, I think we're speaking, you know, in, in this academic year alone, we've seen two major strikes you know, by teachers, you know, and, and that's important, you know, a city that, as large as LA. And so for us to say, we don't see politics, you know, I'm thinking about um, Seattle, they just went to the polls yesterday um, to vote on funding for teachers. And there were people in communities who were actively against funding for teachers. And so that we are not political, I think works to our detriment. And so it is important to be not just aware of issues, but aware of the systems that, that regulate our realities every day. Um, and so that is really, really important work for me. The systems, yes, moving beyond just the individual and thinking about systems. And, and you're and you're so right about, uh, you know, the thing with the with the strikes. You know, we want to stand with teachers who are walking out or who are striking or whatever. But that is, in fact, a political act. Yeah. It, it, it's something that. Um, it's disrupting the status quo. Yeah. And that's something, you know, that you mentioned, you know, more than one time in your book, there's a whole section that's called you, Di you can disrupt the status quo in your class. Yeah. And in it, you talk about questioning what defines classroom culture mm -hmm. and identifying any groups of students who, you know, and this is a direct quote from the book that consistently benefit less from the way that things are. Absolutely. And I, I love that definition of it. Can you talk more about this, this disrupting status quo in class? Certainly. And, and again, I have become really ill at ease with how things are. Again, that we are a society that is totally okay with sleeping at night, even though large numbers of disabled kids don't get the access that they need to school. You know, we are a society that has grown okay with the reality that a large number of girls or children of color don't get what they need out of school. And that's just how things are. And so that's what I call status quo. And so there are kids who benefit less from the way things are. Um, and our data in every district, in every school shows us who those kids are. So it's not just this kind of like pie in the sky number. We can name the kids depending on the school. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's really important to assign names to our data so that we can think these are the kids that aren't receiving a benefit from the way that we're doing things right now. And, and what's interesting is I have been very upfront with people when I talk about the work that that overwhelmingly those are the kids of color, overwhelmingly those are the disabled kids, overwhelmingly those are our girls. And so school as we do it now is sexist, is racist, is ableist. And that's really important to say. Um, now, now, one of the things that often happens in common discourse when we talk about things like sexism or racism or ableism, people get really emotional about that. And they're like, well, I am not racist because I am nice, or I am not sexist because I say hi to women in the office, or I am not ableist because I have a friend that's disabled. And I think it's really important to note here that when we talk about these things, sexism, racism, ableism, these things are not merely personality traits. Rather, I posit that these things are systems. And the systems are the rules, the policies, the procedures, the customs that govern a place that lead to inequitable outcomes for specific subsets of people. So any rule, any policy, any tradition that leads to an inequitable outcome for girls is a sexist system. Any rule, any policy, any tradition that leads to an inequitable outcome for children of color is a racist system. And so again, when we look at the rules and systems that govern school, um, it is clear from our data that we are okay with racism, that we are okay with sexism. And I really wanted to use the book to say, actually, we're not okay with those things. Um, and so then one question that I wanted to ask was, well then, what are the specific systems? I wanted to name them, you know, and, and oftentimes people say to me, well, Cornelius, I'm not the governor. I'm not the superintendent. I'm not the chancellor. How can I impact systems of oppression that are alive in schools? And one of the things that I've done is I've really taken a look at classrooms. And so, yes, um, I am not the governor, so I can't impact the state. You know, I am not the mayor. I can't impact the city. I'm not the chancellor, but I am the seventh grade teacher. And there are systems, there are rules, there are practices, there are customs that govern my seventh grade classroom. And those rules, those systems, as they exist, marginalize some groups of kids. And so one of the things that I can do is I can labor intentionally to change those things so that the outcomes for the kids that I see every day 
are better. Um, and, and it's really exciting work to do. And when I think about systems, those systems can be anything from the way we do our seating arrangements to the way that we expect kids to turn in work to the way that I have kids like, you know, work in their notebooks. Um, I talked to a kid um, at the beginning of the school year this year. It was um, early September. We start after Labor Day here in the city. And, um, and I did the typical teacher thing where I mandated that all the kids bring a certain kind of notebook and that they have their name on the upper left hand corner of the cover you know the thing that we do every year um Mm -hmm. and 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 this one kid um and I, i sent the note home they needed three spiral notebooks for my class um and this one kid came to me um and and he said that you know cornelius you just gave you know you know people a marginally hard time for not having spiral notebooks. Um, and he's like, and I get why you want kids to have spiral notebooks. He's like, I get it. I totally respect you. You're the teacher. Um, but he said, but also I'm left-handed and writing in a spiral notebook really hurts my hand. And so whenever I have to write in the notebook, I write slow. The ink gets all over the page. It's really messy. I don't like it. I don't want a spiral notebook. Um, and in that moment, I'm so glad that he brought that up to me. And I was just like, of course, I'm not going to make you have the spiral notebook. But unfortunately, this is my 19th year of teaching. He was the first kid to ever call me out on that. And so I don't know how many kids over 19 years have had to suffer through the spiral notebook that marginalizes them. Um, and he was just like, look, I'll do a lot better with a composition notebook. So I'm not arguing against the notebook. I'm not arguing against the writing that you want me to do. It's just that if I write in that notebook, I'm not going to produce what I know I can produce. And so and it just I just went home and I really thought I was like, wow, I have been such a stickler for the rules, not even really thinking how that rule might marginalize specific kids in the room. And that's a small example where, you know, how many of us have been such sticklers for the rules, for the customs, for the systems that marginalize kids, you know. And so me insisting on that notebook made it incredibly uncomfortable for my left handed student. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky enough that he was brave enough to come talk to me about it. But then I look back on my 19 years and I'm like, how many kids weren't? And so how many kids had to live in that discomfort mm-hmm. and just be OK with it? And so and, and what that does over time, you know, so there are these small things, but there are the bigger things, you know, like one of my um, best educator friends on the planet um, kind of left me eight years ago to become a principal. Um, she was the literacy coach that raised me. And I tell this story often, but she is perhaps my best teacher friend in life. You know, she taught me everything that I know about teaching literacy. And eight years ago, she, you know, left school to become a principal. So she left teaching. Um, but then she got her own school. And so it was really, really exciting. And, and because we're really good friends, we still check in with each other each Sunday night. And about a year and a half ago, she called me. Um, it was March. And she called and she was just like, hey, it's been one of the toughest marches of my career. And and for a woman like that, I wasn't really expecting a statement like that because again, this is the strongest educator that I know. Um, And so she's like, yeah, it's been a tough march and I've had to suspend um, 12 kids this march. And and, and if you know where we teach, um, suspending 12 kids in one month is a huge number. Um, and she, as she continued, one of the things that she said to me, she's like, you know, Cornelius, I really feel like this number, this 12 suspensions has a racial dynamic to it. And, and she said, you know, of the 12 kids that I suspended, um, nine of them were black or Latino males. And so that's 75%. But, but the problem with that number is black or Latino males make up less than 20% of my school. And, and, and statistically, that is a racist outcome, that, that people who make up a statistical minority in your school make up an overwhelming majority of the suspensions. And so we wanted to look at that. And she's like, yep, absolutely, this has a racial component. This outcome is racist statistically. Um, but, but the thing about that is, she's like, Cornelius, we've been friends for years. You know, like, you know that I am not a racist person. You know that I don't run a racist school, yet my school is, is perpetuating this racist outcome. And, and fortunately, because we're friends, we got to sit and look at her data and we, we kind of put all the office referrals out on the table. And, and one of the things that we saw was we saw right away that um, I think of the, of the 12 office referrals that led to the suspensions, 10 of them occurred in a social studies classroom. So not in the same social studies classroom, but in the social studies department. And so she's like, wow, okay, so 10 of my 12 suspensions originated in a social studies class. Um, and so, and what was powerful is 
she was like, you know, my social studies teachers are the most progressive people on campus. They're the people who are most willing to talk about this. So on the following Monday, you know, in New York City, we have professional development on Mondays. So on the following Monday, we gathered the social studies teachers and we just shared the data with them. We were like, you know, last month we suspended 12 kids. 10 of those suspensions originated in your classrooms. We need to take a look at this. And, and they were game to talk about it. So we talked about it. And after about 25 minutes of talking, one of the things that we discovered was that in that particular school, reading and writing were taught in a workshop-based way. Um, science was taught through inquiry. Mathematics was hands-on. Arts were through exploration. But social studies was taught through lecture. And so we began to ask ourselves the inquiry mm-hmm. question. And again, we know that that correlation does not equal causality. And I'm a researcher. So we, we asked ourselves an inquiry question. We like, could it be that lecturing at kids for 45 minutes is leading to the kinds of disciplinary actions that encourage suspension? Like, could it be? You know, and, and once you ask an inquiry question, you've got to do the action research. So we did um, two weeks of action research. So we said, what would happen if we changed our teaching methodology for two weeks? Would office referrals go up or would they go down? Um, and so we decided that we were going to try to use centers. So we did centers-based activities for 10 school days, two weeks. Um, and each day we monitored three things. We monitored student affect. We monitored their productivity, so how productive they were, how much social studies they did. And then we measured, of course, how many kids received disciplinary action and had to be removed from the room. Um, and over two weeks, we found that office referrals went down. And so, and so, and what was interesting, and, and when we, we, we did lots of kind of at the end of class interviews with kids. Um, so for 10 days of centers, we had all these interviews, we had all the student data in the form of their work, and then we had the number of office referrals themselves. And we were really able to sit at the end of that two weeks and say, wow, because we changed our teaching methodology, suspensions went down. And so, so that idea to change our methodology was an anti-racist act, even though it had nothing to do with signing a petition, even though it had nothing to do with going to a march, even though it had nothing to do with supporting Black Lives Matter, by changing our teaching methodology, less kids were suspended. So fewer kids had to leave the classroom, more kids had access to social studies. And and so when I talk about systems, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about looking at our everyday practice, our traditions, our customs, and really thinking about which ones of these customs marginalize kids disproportionately. And we found in that specific instance that lecturing at kids for 45 minutes was just not working. And how many schools do we lecture at kids, watch them get suspended and keep lecturing? You know, and so when I think about what it means to be an anti-racist practitioner, it means looking at the things that marginalize kids of color and changing those things. When I think about what it means to be fully inclusive of gender or of class, it means looking at the things that marginalize those kids and changing our practice. What advice would you give teachers who want to make a change in the norms in their school or their classroom, but they aren't sure how to make or execute on a plan? And I'm a huge fan of inquiry, you know, that action research has been how we have defined ourselves as a profession. And so really, if something bothers me as a teacher, so if I'm looking at my data and the girls aren't achieving, or if I'm looking at my data and my kids with disabilities just aren't getting what they need, then I get to invent something. And so when we look at our heroes, the single... um, most common characteristics that our heroes have. So no matter who our heroes are, from Martin Luther King to Mae Jemison to Frederick Douglass, whoever we want to think about, all of our heroes um, had imagination, that they were able to imagine a reality that is better than the one that we currently exist in. So if the reality that I currently exist in says that girls don't do science well, then can I imagine a reality where girls would have more access to science. And then once I imagine that reality, I try it. And so five days of action research, 10 days of action research, where I invent a thing for my class, and then I try the thing. And again, I'm not trying the thing forever, but I'm trying to think for five or 10 days. And what happens when I try a thing is then I begin to measure outcomes. So I look at how productive are the kids? How happy are they? You know, are kids, you know, being removed from the classroom? Are kids like achieving more? Are they scoring higher in science? And then I can take that data and then I can sit with my principal and I can say, hey, you know, I was really worried about the girls, but then for five days I tried this thing 
and here's what happened to my data when I tried this thing, or I was really worried about the kids with disabilities, or I was really worried about the kids from single parent homes, and here's what I tried, and here's how my data shifted. And I think that that's our work as teachers, that you know that it's important to note that, that there will still be things in our school that are, are hard to deal with, and there will still be things in our school that, that we want to see improve, but if we wait around for the school district to tell us, if we wait around for even the principal or the literacy coach to tell us that we're going to be waiting for a long time. And action research inquiry work allows us to take that practice into our own hands and, and walk toward the results that we want to see. There's so many good things in your book and so many, so many great topics that we've discussed so far. I feel like um, this could be like a six hour podcast if I could get to all the questions that I have for you. But I want to give you a chance to share the most important idea from your book, the, the one thing that you wish every teacher understood. And, and I think it's an idea that, that has kind of permeated our conversation this evening and this idea that we cannot be okay with the way things are, that, um, that it's just too dire for too many kids, that education matters a lot. And when families send their kids to school, they send us their best kids. They don't keep the good ones at home, you know? And, and so many times we make excuses for the way things are by saying, well, this is how we've always done it, or, you know, things aren't ever gonna change, or I'm just a teacher, what power do I have? And the most important thing to me is that, yeah, I'm just a teacher and we have a whole lot of power um, that, that to be able to step back, look at my practices, look at my customs, look at my traditions, and do the kind of action research that's gonna lead to change really matters a lot to me. And I hope that people read We Got This and and really take the title to heart that, that I don't have to wait for City Hall to say, let's do this thing. I don't have to wait for the state of New York to say that, yes, we're finally gonna get on board with equity, that I can look at the inequitable outcomes in my school, in my department, in my class, and I can address those things in a really intentional way using action research or inquiry. That's what matters a lot to me. Thanks for listening. You can follow Cornelius Minor on Twitter. His handle is Mr. Minor, M-I-S-T-E-R-M-I-N-O-R. Or check the show notes for links to his Twitter handle and to his new book called We Got This equity, access, and the quest to be who our students need us to be. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.